My name is Pamela May. I am a neuropsychologist and I'll be providing a very brief lecture on the topic of psychometrics. Psychometrics, if you're not familiar with the term, refers to the theory and practice of measuring cognitive capacities and processes. And this, is a, this is an area that could be discussed over a semester or more in college, so please refer to these slides for only a very brief introduction. This particular topic is of interest for anyone who is administering tests or completing assessments to assess cognitive functioning. You may often hear the terms assessment and testing. People may use them interchangeably. However, they are different in the field of psychology. An assessment is a more comprehensive term it refers to the entire process of compiling information about a person and using it to make inferences. An assessment can include a clinical interview, the behavioral observations you make during the evaluation, as well as results from testing. While testing is in, using a particular product to obtain a, a measurement of interest, such as using the MOCA to obtain a measurement of general cognitive status. So testing is measuring something in particular, while assessment includes gathering of information in multiple ways, including tests, and making judgments off of this information. So what is a test? A test is a standardized procedure for sampling behavior and describing it with categories or scores that are useful. We'll talk more about what standardized procedures are in the next few slides. Most tests have, have norms or standards, which their results can be used to predict other, more important behaviors. And we'll also talk more about what norms or standards are in the next few slides. A test provides a limited sample of behavior for practical purposes, similar to using the MOCA, which is maybe about a 15-20 minute test to understand one's general cognitive function, the level of that. Um, it's important to note that test items do not need to reflect the behavior the test is attempting to predict. So for example, if answering true to the question, I drink a lot of water, happens to predict major depressive disorder, then this seemingly unrelated question may be a useful index for major depressive disorder. Just something to keep in mind. And also I would like you to keep in mind that test results usually portray an abstract concept has no direct material existence, such as intelligence or IQ. These are abstract terms. However, these test results are useful in predicting non-test behaviors, such as how one functions um, day by day. So we previously brought up the term standardized. What does it mean? So standardized means that the procedures for administering and scoring a particular test are uniform from one examiner and setting to another. The standardization, standardization rests on the administration directions and the competence of the examiner. So of course you want the administration directions to be pretty clear and specific. As well as you would want the examiner to be very um, uh, diligent in following these directions with each patient and each circumstance. So think about how uh, this could be applied to you. Think about how this could go well or not so well. Think about if the MOCA, um, that particular words or digits need to be set at a particular rate. Think about the influence of you if you were to say those words or digits too quickly or too slowly. How would that impact the patient's performance? Now imagine yourself um, giving that same test to that same patient a year from now, and then you're following the administration directions diligently. Think about how, if it's a valid comparison, um, to compare the results from the first testing to the second testing when the procedures were different. So I think it's important to always consider how the test was administered because it may not be a fair apples to apples comparison if the test was not administered the same way across time points. At one time point, the patient may have had more leeway or been able to get a higher score because the test was made easier for them or could have been made 
more difficult for them based on, han, on how well the test was administered. Think about your demeanor also as you're administering tests. Um, test developers may also specify a particular demeanor in their manual. Of course, you'd want examiners to be diligent and following um, the administration guidelines as well as they can, but you also don't want them to be too cold or, and, or rigid, or you also don't want them to be overly friendly, like for example, giving the patient the answers to the questions. You want to be in that middle ground of being able to build rapport and be able to support the patient in completing the test. We also mentioned the idea of norms. Norms are a summary of test results for a large and representative group of subjects or people, and this is usually referred to as the standardization sample. Now, this group must be representative of the population for whom the test is intended. So think about this. Think about testing an older adult and you have a memory test. Of course, you'd want the norms for that memory test to be based on older adults. It would not make sense to have it based on children or adolescents, um, so keep that in mind. Norms help establish an average performance for that particular person, say, based on level of education or age, and etc. Just gives you a little bit of a standard or reference point. Norms can help you also understand how frequently or how likely one could get a high score or a low score on that test. Also keep in mind that norms can actually become outdated uh, based on specifically on the test material. Uh, so tests and norms every now and then need to be revised to be more reflective of today, today's population. Let's talk about measurement error. It's a little bit abstract, but important to go over briefly. The main message is that every test will always reflect some degree of measurement error, whether it's the test itself, the examiner, what have you. The best that we can do is try to minimize the error by using standardized procedures, as we already talked about. It's important to know that the test scores that you get may actually not be the true score for that person. There may be some uh, range around that score, a confidence of interval per se, of possible scores for that person. Um, because we need to take into account error. When you think about scores, think about this algorithm. With X being the observed score, say the total on the MOCA, um, and T being the hypothetical true score plus E for error. So all the scores that you get from the MOCA or any other cognitive test, they do reflect some error. They, do, they are not truly the true score, but it is the best that we can do, um, especially when all the administration directions are followed diligently and we do our best to minimize error. Going a little bit further down the statistics road in psychology, we often assume that scores fall along a normal distribution or a normal curve, which is often true uh, when considering human performances or uh, nature. Um, but as you see here, it is assumed that most performances fall right in the middle in the average range and with equal numbers of performances falling to the left or lower or to the right to the higher of that. And using this normal distribution, we apply statistics to help us interpret the data. In psychology, we often transform the raw score into a different score that's a bit more meaningful so we can compare that individual person's score to a larger group of people, like the norms or their standardization sample. So we could see how well that person is doing compared to their peers in terms of education, age and other demographic variables. So I won't go into these too much, but here are just different ways that a raw score can be transformed, say percentiles, standard scores, or other standard scores, such as T-scores, scaled scores, and IQ standard scores. 
Important things to consider are reliability and validity. These are two very important psychometric properties in terms of understanding how valuable or good a test is. Um, reliability, in other words, is just how consistent is the tool that you're using, for example, the MOCA. It's important to consider because it, it is considered unethical to base important decisions upon test results that are not repeatable or consistent across time or patients. Reliability can be viewed in different ways as multiple facets. Reliability can be viewed as temporal stability, such as how well is one test at one time point, how well is it correlated with a second time point when it's administered again, are they correlated highly. Sometimes you would not expect there to be high temporal stability depending on what you're measuring. Uh, for example, one's mood can be varying across the day or across the week, and so there may not be as much temporal stability for measuring mood over time, um, given that person or what have you. You also need to consider internal consistency, which means are the items within that test related to each other if you have items that are not related to each other, it'll be hard to make any conclusions from um, combining the performances across those items. Um, so you want those items to be similar enough so that you can make a bigger interpretation off of them. You also want there to be an interscore reliability, meaning that if you have one test scored by two different people, you'd want um, that end score to be the same across those two scorers or two people. Um, you wouldn't want the same test to have different outcomes based on who is scoring it. Uh, so these are just different ways to look at reliability. An even more abstract psychometric property is validity. So a test is valid to the extent that inferences made from it are appropriate meaningful and useful. Of course you want your test to be valid, but how do you study it? There are different ways such as content validity, criterion related validity, and construct validity. There are different ways that these can be looked at. Um, so validity is not something that can be just summarized or boiled down into one statistic. It needs to be looked at in different ways. Content validity is assessing as to whether uh, a test has all the different tasks or items that are representative of what it's supposed to be measuring. So for example, if you're assessing the validity, the content validity of a questionnaire or interview um, you have to assess a patient's orientation. Um, if you just had items on orientation to time, that would have poor content validity if you wanted to assess orientation more broadly. You're missing the items related to orientation to self, orientation to place, orientation to situation. So you want to make sure that the test is assessing all the different domains or areas of that behavior um, that you're trying to assess. There's also criterion related validity. So a test is shown to be effective in estimating the examinee's performance on some outcome measure. What does that mean? So for example, a score on a GRE, um, this score is, uh, is, aims to be predictive of success in graduate school. Uh, so this, the um, examining the criterion related validity of the GRE is how well it predicts future behaviors or future outcomes. Uh, if it's valid, there would be a strong correlation there between scores on a GRE and performance in grad school. And construct validity is a little bit more of an umbrella term or a unifying concept for all different kinds of validity uh, evidence. So it's a degree to which a test measures what claims or purports to be measuring. So if you have a measure assessing intel intelligence, um, you need to measure or assess 
is this test actually measuring intelligence or is it actually assessing something else? Um, so these are all very important questions. One of the main messages I'd like you to take away from this presentation is to be critical when you're selecting tests for your patients. Do research on how reliable and valid they are. There are a number of factors that affect the validity of scores from a well-validated test. Keep this in mind when you're meeting with patients. How well uh, they can hear you, uh, see what you're showing them, would certainly affect uh, their performance on a well-validated test. And think about this as sources of error uh, that may affect the validity of their scores. Think about uh, the effect of language. If a, patient's, uh, if a patient's primary language is not the same as the language in which the test was administered, there may also be um, some uh, problems there and leading to a lower score than expected. Think about also the effects of fatigue and how that may also affect someone's performance, usually in a negative direction. And there's also the effect of effort and motivation. Sometimes individuals may not put forth all their effort into the test itself, or they may also uh, fake bad or malinger, um, which would also affect the validity of scores. One of my last remarks is regarding pre-morbid estimates. What makes testing or assessments a little bit difficult is that we often see patients uh, in one snapshot of time or only get to meet them at one time point. And we don't have much data as to how well they functioned previously or throughout their life. In neuropsychology, we try to do our best in terms of estimating how well one intellectually functioned throughout their life to help us understand if a, if a score on a particular test reflects their baseline or impairment. These estimates, pre-morbid estimates, are usually based on their psychosocial history, such as their level of education, occupational level, and or additional cognitive scores, such as reading level or other performances that are highly correlated with intelligence. This leads us to the conclusion of our PowerPoint. I thank you for listening, and please let me know if you have any questions. Don't hesitate to email me if you have any questions, and hopefully this sparked your interest in psychometrics.